Could you start by saying your name and your job title, please? Jade Dernbach, unofficially retired cricketer. <laughs> Available for offers if any come through. <laughs> let's let's try and get you a gig by the end of this. At, at the very least, as a death bowling coach, because that's why I brought yes. you on. Um, I really, uh, you know, we happen to work together on Talk Sport recently, and I was for ages. I wanted someone to come on and talk about just death bowling. Um, and then when we worked together, I was like, great, finally, I've got someone. So you bowled. I don't know if you know all this. You bowled 9.97 balls per match in the last four overs of the innings, right? That is the third highest um, balls per match of any bowler I could find in the database. So I think Alfonso Thomas has you. He's just above 10. And then Mitch Clayden has you. Okay. Um, and, and that's it. It's not Dwayne Bravo. It's not Lassif Malinga. It's not Jasper Brumov. When it comes to the last four overs. So you are one of the deathiest people ever, plus you, <laughs> you then played for a million years. I suppose my first question is, when you grew up, death bowling wasn't really a thing. Uh, how did you sort of fall into that role? I'm assuming first with Surrey. Yeah, it's, it, I've been asked this question before, and actually, you know, trying to think back to understand, was it something I actually thought about, or did it just happen? And I think it just kind of organically happened, really. It was... I think the fact that I was capable of bowling reverse swing with the red ball kind of preempted people in the thought that I could do it. And plus bowling a Yorker was a, was a ball, which thankfully came quite naturally to me. Um, I think my action somewhat lended itself to do that. Um, and then of course, you know, fast forward a couple of years and the introduction of a few slower balls to my game. And all of a sudden that became the kind of the package, which people were looking forward to, to bowl at the end. Let's go. Let's go forward then to the first slow ball. Uh, is the back of the hand your first slow ball? I know it's your true slow ball. Yes. Yeah. It's the the first true. It's 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 my little baby. It's the thing that kind of what I became known for in the end. It it, it offered me a huge amount of success. But equally with that, that that ball took a very long time to develop. Um, it was over probably a two or three year period. I think of me just constantly practicing in the nets before I even brought it into a game. And this was this was back when I was 17 years old. So I remember practicing it, trying to do it in a couple of youth games and my coach being so against it, you know, threatening to never play me again if he sees me bowl it because it would literally go anywhere. Um, I had no control as to where it was going and it became such a fine art of understanding my own particular action and what I needed to do to get the ball down. Because I actually saw there was a young lad who played with me at... Guildford and Surrey youth cricket. His name was Will Saby and he could bowl it perfectly. So I used to play with him on a Saturday and I'd see him run up, bowl this ball. Guys were ducking it left, right and centre and he was cleaning up. And I thought, I want a piece of that. So I just went away and practised. Did you, Is he the one that you first saw bowl it or had you seen it in international cricket? No, hadn't seen it anywhere besides him. He was the first bloke I'd seen bowl it and... There was nobody else who was doing it around, you know, kind of Ian Harvey, I guess, was had yeah. a few slower balls, but his was kind of, because it was a bit more, I felt was a bit more kind of at the side of his hand, not necessarily truly at the back. And he was, you know, keeper stood up to him a lot of the time. So it didn't really have the same impact as if you had a fast bowler running in and keeper standing back and guys are ducking into the ball. That was kind of what excited me about it. Yeah, it, it's really interesting because it was huge in Victorian cricket, obviously. Not just because of Ian Harvey, but um, Simon O'Donnell is, I suppose, the first international bowler to sort of get famous with it. So at that same point that Franklin Stevenson sort of accidentally invents the, the off-cutting slow ball, you know, um, Simon O'Donnell comes through about two or three years later with this back of the handball. And so it, where I played, everyone had it. And then, and then, but when you watch TV, it was, uh, you know, Steve Waugh obviously uh, became a big person with it. Did, Hol Adam Holyoke might have. Adam Holyoke had had slow balls, yeah. Yeah. It came, but to be honest, I it's probably the reason why I'm probably saying it from the perspective that this kid will had such an impact because I probably didn't watch a huge amount of cricket as a young scrum. I just loved playing it. I love playing all sports. So for me, the love of sport was playing it, not necessarily watching it. I guess. Yeah, but but I also think when when you were seventeen. So what year would that have been? That was in 2001, 2002? Yeah, so I, th I think by that point, that back of the hand slow ball, I wouldn't say it had died, but it wasn't even a major thing. So even if you were watching cricket, it's not a surprise that you might have seen someone 
locally bowl it rather than international. It's it's such it's such an interesting ball. Is yours basically a fast wrong un or is yours something slightly different? It's again, it's a, it's a delivery which has developed throughout my career. It's become many number of things. Initially, it was a case of just trying to get as much revolutions on the ball as possible to get the ball to dip. So my only aim was to try and deceive people in the air to kind of get them to duck into it. Mm. That was that was kind of why I developed it. So I was trying to get as full as possible, but be able to get that late dip. So that was initially how it happened. Now, luckily, my elbow kind of hyperextends a bit, so I'm able to twist it the whole way around, which enabled me to do that. Yeah. And, it, and it came quite naturally. As time progressed, that ball then developed into, okay, then there was a the ball that wanted to go up and down. Then there was kind of slightly dropping my arm to get the ball to, to spin, to take it outside of right-handers off stump, or if I wanted to go into the surface or slower ball bounces with it. So it, all, it kind of continuously developed. And the other thing that a lot of people who bowl the back of the hand, I mean, the first thing that you do get told is stop bowling it because it goes everywhere. So you had that. We know that much. The second thing is that a lot of people think it's too slow. So my memory of you is probably low 140s to, you know, 150, you know, um, on, on very good days. So my guess is that your back of the hand slow ball then should have been around 105 to 110. That's a huge drop. And that was part of the reason that people were discouraged from bowling it. Yeah, of course, because there was such a big drop off. Now, you used to have to defend it in the sense of the, the, the problem isn't the the gap or the distance between those two speeds. The biggest thing is how much how much deception I can get through the dip I get in the ball. I don't care whether you've picked it or it's a lot slower or not. If I do you in the flight, it's 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 done its job. It's it's irrelevant in that sense. It's like telling Shane Warne, why does he slow down and toss one up in the air? It's it's the same kind of concept to me in the sense of if I was deceiving the batter, I didn't care what speed. There was a perfect speed for it to come out. And when I wasn't bowling so well, it would dip below that. So I always used to know it had to be at roughly 70 mile an hour, just there or thereabouts. If I was dropping kind of 68 and below, I knew something wasn't quite right. And so you, you start to you know, get better and better at this. Do you have another slow ball, even as a backup? I did have an, I had an off cutter, but I was never, ever very confident with it because I never felt it took enough off the ball. So it was actually quite strange. I I'd probably spent the best part, well, probably my whole international career where people thought I had all these many different slow balls. I actually didn't. I had a slow ball bouncer, which was a, terrible off cutter which i just try to ram into the deck as hard as possible and my back of the hand slow ball that's it so kind of got this this tag of guy with hundreds and hundreds of slow balls I, I really didn't and it kind of used to make me chuckle but i was never really that confident in my off cutter I only became confident probably in the last three to four years of my career well the, the interesting thing kind of about everything you just said there is one thing that i have noticed is that because we called them slow balls People got obsessed with the pace of them. And mm -hmm. you really, the more that I research and, uh, you know, and talk to bowlers like yourself, it's quite clear that it's usually, it's either the deception that you can't see it out of the hand, which is very important, or it's just the amount of revs that you can get on the ball. And sometimes if you look at someone like Harshal Patel on the IPL, he can actually get his to spin sideways. So it's the deviation yep. of the pitch. And then the other thing is that a bit, I think death bowling is probably more like baseball pitching than any other part of cricket in that it's they're trying to hit you for a home run and you're trying not to be hit for a home run, right? That's not quite how we how bowlers and batters work together, even earlier in in an IP, in, a power, uh, in the power play or something else. And so most of the great pitchers probably have two or three really good pitchers. And if you're a really great death bowler, you probably have a natural advantage, like Lassif Malinga with the low arm or Jasper Brummer with the what would you call him, the front arm, where he bowls from closer than everyone yeah. else. Um, or you have one great slow ball and one really good stock ball or two great slow balls or, you know, two really great stock balls and, and one slow ball. You don't actually need that much, do you? No, and people don't no. face you that much. I don't think people understand this, but even in the blast where you guys play a lot of cricket, you weren't bowling to the same guys probably more than 20 or 30 times a year. It's hard for them to get used to it anyway. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's, and that's the thing. And you you kind of forget that sometimes along the way you try and reinvent yourself, create new balls the whole time. You're always trying to adapt and develop. But fundamentally, death bowling comes down to bowling, I would suggest, 
two or three, exactly as you've put, two or three balls very, very well and know that you can rely on them. If you have that, and that's certainly what I felt I had in the beginning part of my career and middle part, kind of uh, the initial stage of the international stuff, I just had those balls on luck, you know, committed to my Yorker 100%, knew I had a great slurp ball and I could bowl a bouncer. That was all I needed. The the other thing that I find uh, really interesting is that I'm going to lump you into the sort of Dwayne Bravo. I know you're a bit quicker than Dwayne Bravo, but the guys who do have the slow ball that has the um, uh, huge drop, right? So the huge mm-hmm. overspin. It does seem that the, your sort of that sort of if that's one of your main skills at the death, those bowlers seem to come in waves. Are there just periods where you just can't get the revs that you need because you're you're trying to bowl spin at you know, 90 miles an hour, really, or in Dwayne Bravo's case, 82 miles an hour. But you, you're putting a lot of stress through your body. And it does appear like, if you, you look at it, so so the, the guys who bowl the great Yorkers at the death, they usually, uh, they, they're quite solid. Whereas you'll have a period where you go for a lot of runs, but you'll take a lot of wickets. And then you have another period where you won't go for many runs and you'll still take a good amount of wickets. Is that just wear and tear? Because you must be putting so much, well, you've got double jointed elbow as well. Oh, sorry, hyperextended elbow. So you'd be putting a lot of pressure on your, your shoulder, your elbow, and your wrist every time you bowl one of those solo balls. Yeah, but bowling at the end, I found, yeah, bowling death overs are certainly the most taxing and grueling on the body. Because not only is it harder on your body, and I say that because of the positions you have to get yourself into, you're kind of trying to open yourself up, staying, still trying to stay strong on the crease and still trying to fling the ball down there at 90 mile an hour. Then, as you say, turn my arm completely the other way, try and bowl a slow ball, still get over the top so I can get revs going over whilst my body's trying to pull me off the pitch. That's tough. Then you throw into that game scenario situations, the mental fatigue, but then you've got to keep doing that game after game on tour. And you just, and especially if that's your, your main job, you're only ever involved in those pressure situations. So it does take its toll over a period of time. Um, the other big thing that plays into that is confidence. Now, it, it's so difficult to measure that because you can practice well, you can train well. That doesn't equate to you playing well in the game. And the kind of the torment of losing games for your team and, and competitions and World Cups, that takes a toll. So when you're stood at the end of your mark and you've got to try and commit to bowling this slow ball as hard as you can, but in the back of your mind, you're worried about where it's going to go or whether you're going to get hit for six. That, again, is a, can be a factor as to why the ball didn't come out quite as well. Yeah, I remember talking to a bunch of cricketers about Dwayne Bravo, and they said, uh, and because if you look at him statistically, he's probably not one of the all-time elite death bowlers, right? Mm-hmm. But what what they said was, you have to understand that he's a you know an all rounder, and the ability his main skill is the fact that he will say he will bowl at the death in any game, whereas you know amateurs probably think the professionals are all like, yeah, I'll do whatever job I have to do, whereas they're like, no, I don't, I don't bowl at the death. That's not my thing. So there does seem to be in that particular spot more of you, you almost coaches and captains will trust you more if you're the person who just automatically puts your hand up to bowl at the death. Of course, because the, there's no hiding place. You, you're going to bowl at the end. You have to be complete 100% okay with the fact that majority of the time you are not going to come out on top. That's the fact. So it takes a certain kind of someone to put themselves in harm's way, essentially, for that one time that you do win the game for your team or you do win that series. But more often than not, you're not, you're not going to be able to do that. So not everybody's wired up that way. And there was probably plenty of people who were more skillful than me, quicker than me, or all these things, but they didn't want to do that job or weren't as comfortable doing it. So somebody has to do it. Um, and I'm, I'm thankful that I got as many opportunities as I did to do that because I loved it. I absolutely loved bowling at those times of the game. I always wanted to be involved in the pressurized situations because I didn't see it that that was just more fun to me. That was where my enjoyment factor came. I wanted to I wanted to have the opportunity to affect an outcome of the game, um, not sit and watch somebody else do it. The other thing is, uh, your career is really interesting because you become a major nation's first specialist death bowler, really. So it's not that England hadn't had death bowlers before. Obviously, through one-day cricket, you kind of have them, but it was really, in those days, it was whoever opened the bowling, bowled at the death. 
obviously someone like Goffey was a specialist, but it was before people really started to hit everyone everywhere. Um, so you, you do have other players, but you became one of the first death specialists. We didn't really know anything about well, T20 cricket specifically, but also, you know, the changing of one day cricket. One day cricket became a different sport in, in the period that you played. You must have felt very misunderstood the way that people commentated on you, people wrote about you, and certainly the fans thought about it. Because, I mean, it probably took most people... Well, even now you hear Owen Morgan the other day defending the England uh, death bowlers when, when they on a day they got it wrong. But by, base, by saying, you know, people don't really understand what this is. So you were sort of in the middle of all that and it must have been very tough to try and explain in a pub to a yelly person that no actually <laughs> going it under eight and over was a victory uh, it's yeah it's it's so it's well, i can laugh at about it now because it's it's been and gone but yeah probably my biggest frustration really is that and sometimes i felt like i just wanted to scream because I knew what I was doing and I knew the job I was doing for the team. And at the time, absolutely, you know, the likes of Cookie and the senior guys, Swanee, certainly I remember even Jimmy Anderson when he was involved in one day team. When I was doing that job, they were all very happy I was doing it because one, nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> so I was taking the heat off everybody else. But two, they could see the commitment and the reason was why I was doing it. So having the backing of the players at the time was great. But the problem, that's not enough. Because when the commentators, like you say, are constantly on your back, when the written press are constantly on your back, when you step out of your house and you're trying to go for a drink or a bit of food and the bloke down the pub knows a bit more about cricket than you do and is telling you how rubbish you are, that slowly but surely over time starts corroding away at you at your confidence, at your ability to keep standing up in those pressurized situations, to keep being able to deliver. It's not an excuse, it's a fact. Mm. You know, you can't keep beating down something and expecting a better outcome. Um, which, yeah, in the end, was probably my downfall. Uh, you know, the, the outside noise became a bit too much. I d you know, self-doubt crept in. Um, all these things I'd never had before. So, yeah, all in all, it, it uh, curtailed what was a promising start to career. Well, I mean, on top of that, you sort of started in the Twitter era, if I remember quite <laughs> rightly as well. And you yeah. were quite punchy on Twitter back in the day, mm. Jade. Uh, yes. I always found it quite entertaining to watch you uh, take people on. So, I mean, it, it felt like you were doing this new job at this time where this new, you know, where, where the fans, they didn't even have to, you know, uh, no, uh, you know, they didn't even have to go to the Beehive to find you, right? Like, <laughs> um, not that I'm saying you're drinking the Beehive if people are going to hang out there um, looking for you. But, you know... Um, the, the whole thing was completely different. Let's say Goffey. So Goffey was kind of England's death bowler before you. But Goffey was a star before death bowling mattered, right? Mm -hmm. You know, he, he was a star, you know, in, in the mid-90s and, you know, was already a celebrity. There was no other really England specialist death bowler. And then you're living in that professional era where you're online. You're trying to build your brand and, you know, and do all those things that young athletes are trying to do. And you're doing this job that no one really understands. I can understand why everything sort of built on you and, and, you know, eventually it chipped away from you. What sort of support did you have from Surrey in England at that point? The support I had from Surrey was always brilliant throughout. Surrey was my kind of rock in the background as such. So anytime I'd come back from a tour, I knew I was going back home to Surrey and I always got looked after. Everybody loved me there. Fans, people knew what I did because I'd been successful for a long period of time and I continued to do that. So that was never, that was never a problem for me. England's England's a different, England's a different kettle of fish, really, in the sense of it's so cutthroat. That's what international sport is. It's difficult. It's cutthroat. There isn't any time to be pandering around anyone, or there certainly wasn't at that point. Um, yeah, it was it was a difficult one because I was as much to blame as the whole situation too, because I certainly probably moved away from what made me successful. Maybe, you know, maybe I wasn't training as well as I used to do. And I was then concentrating on too many things that actually didn't matter in the end, you know, listening to all the noise. And, you know, I, I remember trying to write something on an undershirt before playing an ODI against India in India, because I knew the commentators were on my back and I just knew I needed one performance to, to basically, in my mind, stick a middle finger up at them. You know, it was that, that's where my mind had kind of taken me to. And then when it didn't go so well, I'm stood out in the field thinking, I would rather be anywhere else but here. Mm. So you're dealing with all that. As you say, that's that's the height of Twitter. Twitter's just starting. Nobody knew what social media really was going to be or turn into at that point. So 
for me, it was a case of initially it started great because people were interacting with you. I felt like a superstar because everything was going well. Mm. The minute it turned, all of a sudden I, I experienced the ugly side of social media before it was even recognized, you know, where anybody could say anything and there was absolutely no comeuppance for it. So for me, the character I am, well, I'd, I'd jump on the front foot and I would answer back and not keep quiet and try and be who I was as authentically as I could, but not really understanding that it was, that it was a losing battle. There's, you can't beat social media. No, knowing that now is different, but had I known that then, I wouldn't have been on social media. If I was an England cricketer now, I don't think I would be. I don't think there's enough upside. I don't even think commercially there's enough upside with everything else you have to deal with. But that's just my own opinion. Yeah, no, I mean, it's really interesting. You know, I've talked to a lot of players about this over the years. Um, uh, in fact, your, your, your friend Gareth Batty, who's a new, new Surrey coach, I believe. <laughs> well, at least <laughs> a suspected new Surrey coach. We'll go with that for now, depending on when this podcast comes out. But, um, you know... It, for someone like him, he just he lives in a completely different world than you and I live in because mm-hmm. you know we do have to you, we do get involved in in social media and we can't help ourselves. I think I thought the the tide really turned on you around the time that the the stats started coming out that you had the highest economy in ODI cricket um, ever. Now I don't know if you know this, but Ireland's Peter Chase now has an, a higher economy in ODI cricket than you do. So uh, I don't know if you know Peter, but uh, you probably owe him a sorry, drink. Sorry, Peter. Um, <laughs> Sorry, um, but that really felt like that was that was the Jay Dernback era and that that there's no way once that stat is attached to you and the way that England you know as someone who is a you know does, does work in stats sometimes I'll throw something out on talk sport just as information mm-hmm. and then next thing you know it's like it f- filters through all the newspapers right and then obviously onto social media and at the time when you're saying it it's not really loaded it's just oh this 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 thing has happened but a lot of their sort of the England press, that, that is so headliney. That felt like it just got attached to your name at that point. It was an easy thing to do, as you said, because it's a stat. You can't argue it. So you can't all of a sudden stick your hand and go, yes, but by the way, I bowl all my overs here. No, no, that's why you're in the England side. So shush. Then the, then the next thing is, did people take into consideration how many rule changes there were during that period? What about <laughs> when they just decide to bring another man into the ring? You know, still had to bowl those death overs. That, that my job didn't change. My, my stats didn't get changed accordingly. Hmm. But no, no, that doesn't matter. You're still labeled as the most expensive. So anytime something went wrong, it was an easy thing to bring up and to say and to sling mud at. But, you know, wh- whenever do you hear about how many games you won or how many series we got over the line? You don't hear that. But again, I, I, can't, I was kind of that... <sighs> I was kind of that villain at times, which was easy because I had tattoos, I had earrings. I, I like to celebrate a wicket. So it's all good when it's going well. But if it's not, we'll throw a few daggers. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we talked about this before, but I told you that I basically got into analytics because of you. And I don't think it was when you were playing for England, although uh, you may still have been um, playing for England at that time. But I'm pretty sure you were playing in the Big Bash um, and the commentators were talking about your high economy and i'm sitting there screen i remember i was in my uncle's house i don't know why i was i was back home in australia and i was in my uncle's house and, and i'm screaming at the tv his economy doesn't mean anything because he's not bowling the same overs that you know liam dawson is bowling sorry liam if you're listening but you know liam dawson's bowling the easier middle overs and you're bowling these at the end it didn't make any sense to me to compare them and so i went and made something called true economy rate where we do it contextually and when I and I was very happy you were the first player I went and looked up when we worked it all out. <laughs> and you were um, a positive bowler. So even though your actual economy was, you know, o- quite often over eight and, you know, can be really high in some seasons, compared to where you were bowling, it was still actually a positive bowling economy. And that, 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 that conversation didn't happen when you were playing. Like that was, you know, I, I mean, I was only just starting to get into it. We had, I think Crickviz was starting at around the same time, but there really wasn't anyone in your corner at that point. And I heard this story, and I don't know if, if you've ever heard this story before, but it was passed on to me that when you played for England, if you got hit for a boundary, the next ball, you would almost always default to a back of the hand slower ball um, towards the end. Mm-hmm. And so batters being, you know, I mean, a bat, batters, at your pace, a batter can't actually pick up the ball properly, right? To, to be able to hit it, they yeah. have to track it and, and take a guess. If, so what they're really doing is they're reading you. 
mm-hmm. and they're reading everything about you, you running in, your hand position, the fielding, and you know everything that's come before that. Um, so if you fall into that sort of uh, consistent trap, I would assume that that you know the smarter batters were just milking you, knowing that if they can get you for one boundary, they can probably take you for two boundaries in a row. But I would have thought at that point in your career, I don't even think that information would be being fed back to you. No, that's the first I've heard of it. Probably a bit late. I should have sent yeah. you a message a couple of years ago. Might have had a couple more games, pal. <laughs> <laughs> but but it does show what, you know, you, you really were right at that point where everything was changing. Mm-hmm. Um and did you develop as a death bowler through that? I mean, you talked about the one-day cricket. You know, you have fielders coming and going and different power plays. Was it you could call a power play? Uh, yeah. I can't even remember all the stupid uh, conditions God. that we it had. It got ridiculous at one point. Yeah, so it must have felt for you just a little bit like every time you worked out the system, the system changed. And you're doing this new thing at the same time. Yeah, and, and the game was constantly changing at that point because... T20 was probably year on year just developing, developing, developing. That then creeps into one day cricket and ODI cricket and stuff starts changing and how people think you should be bowling changes. So this whole this whole kind of concept of what I thought I was or had believed in and trusted in, then all of a sudden gets changed because no, you need to now become unpredictable. So this is what you need to do. So you have this slow ball, use it. You're in the team to bowl slow balls or you have this, back. so use it. Then I start overusing it, then get criticized for using the slow ball I got picked because I had. But then I'm trying to be unpredictable because these are the things, these are all the things you want me to be. So I felt like I was trying to live up to this, this uh, idealistic version of a death bowler that people were kind of constantly developing and changing. And I actually just lost what I was and stuck, you know, like what you said, kind of just reverting to slower balls because I got hit for a boundary had you seen me in the early part of my career that definitely wouldn't have been the case because the Yorker was my number one delivery that was my go-to ball it's a ball I trusted most the slower ball was the change up I maybe bowled it once and over but the longer I stay in that side people said no bowl it more bowl it more because the minute they saw success with it why wouldn't you bowl it more if you had success so it became that's what I felt like I tussled with the whole time was what I authentically thought I was but what I thought I needed to be to stay in the team. And I assume over your career, because you played in the era where the analytics and everything else came into it, I'm assuming over your career, you learned, you got more and more information. Did you change the way that you prepared? So, you know, when, you know, you're playing in 2007, 2008, you probably don't know that much about the batter other than what you've heard, right? Mm-hmm. And then by the end of your career, it's like you, you can get a complete heat map of, of, you know, where they're good, where they're not good and where they're going to try and hit you and all those sorts of things. Yeah, I, it definitely, yes. When f- the full spectrum of it with the analytics and, and everything, I, I've got a bit of a sort of weird stance in it, I guess. N- now they've sort of stepped away a little bit, I, I guess. I think for me personally, the, the introduction to more and more stats wasn't beneficial for me because you get a stat pack often and there'll be video clips on there and there's, here's all the batters. These are where he scores his boundaries. I'd sit and I'd watch these before a game. And all of a sudden I would have built this guy up because he looks like the best player I've ever seen. <laughs> because if I'm watching all of his boundary options, he seems to hit every ball for a boundary. So then in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, okay, well, I can't miss there. I can't miss straight. He often cuts wide, so I can't be wide. He seems to pick up slow balls. Quite well. Where do I bowl to this guy? And then all of a sudden, I've got to turn up in the T20 in front of a packed house and figure it out in the middle of that arena where I'm going to bowl to him because I've kind of psyched myself out with all this statistics. Now, yes, it works for some people, absolutely. And take what you need from it. It's brilliant. There is loads of information there. But fundamentally, don't forget what makes you good. You know, what, what do I bring to the table? I bring to the table a good Yorker, a slower ball and a bouncer. I just need to figure out which order and when to bowl it. Simple as. And had I stuck to that more often, I think uh, it might have been a slightly different conversation. I should, I should also say as an analyst, I try and show where the batters are weak more than yes. where they're strong. Uh, I think it's important for you to know where they're going to try and hit the boundaries from and, and, and if there's an absolute no-go zone. Um, but most no-go zones are don't bowl length, right? <laughs> it's pretty simple, yeah. Don't Do you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, occasionally there'll be a certain player who's a little bit different, but generally it's like don't bowl length at this time of the game to this person. But yeah, yeah I, I think I think that's very uh, that's very fair. So the other thing is, what we were talking about before about the baseball pitcher, there was 
I can't remember which book I was reading. It might have been The MVP Machine, um, which has a lot about uh, baseball pitchers in it. And there was one particular baseball pitcher who really, it really struck me that this is something that should, probably should be used with not all death bowlers, but I think specifically it could have helped someone like you, which was what, what it comes back to is the batters are reading the bowler as much as possible. And you're playing like this game to stay one step ahead. But they have spent their whole life reading bowlers to get to that point to be facing you in the game. And what this baseball uh, pitcher did was he actually used to go in with like a pre-plan mm -hmm. of what his pitches were to each batter. No matter what the, the batter did earlier in the game or in that didn't matter because he had, he's like, okay, well, this is my ninth pitch to him. And my ninth pitch was going to be whatever. Now, obviously he had a ridiculous memory and was, you know, a different level person, but in baseball pitching, usually the advice comes from the pit, uh, from the catcher. Right. And his whole thing was, I don't want the catcher to give me advice because the catcher thinks like a hitter. Mm -hmm. And so he had this real pre -pro programmed way of dealing with it. And I often thought in cricket, that might be even easier because you have six balls to think about it when the other guy's bowling. Um, and you'd be able to go in and go, okay, this is my plan. I know who the two batters are. I've got option one, two, three, and four for this batter and option one, two, three, and four for this batter. I do think if there's anything that could help death bowlers, it might actually be to not react to what has happened the ball before, which is the hardest thing in the world, mm -hmm. right? I mean, yeah. that is, even, you can bowl, how many times in your life you've bowled a half volley and some guy has munted it nowhere and you've walked away like you've bowled a great Yorker, whereas in actual fact, you've missed your length by a meter and he just happened to miss hit it. So that's what I, I always wondered if that was something that could be, that could be brought into because we, you're boiling it back down to what we talked about before. You have three good balls and now it's about how you randomly generate them to this mm -hmm. particular batter. It, did you ever have discussions like this? Because you bowled with another great death bowler. You bowled with Azam Mood as well. Yeah. So you guys had this great partnership. Did you two go about it differently? Or, you know? I was such a field bowler. Like it, it, but in, in the sense of saying I was a field bowler, there was probably a method. And it was generally, I'd always want to start my over with a Yorker because I thought it was the least likely ball to go for six. If I nail my Yorker, the ball doesn't go anywhere. I don't go for a boundary. So I was always looking to not go for any boundaries. Obviously, you're always not looking to go for a boundary, but specifically at the start of the over, to get into your over, to put the pressure on the batter. So if I felt I got a couple of good Yorkers in, then my slow ball became a bigger weapon because I knew they were going to come harder. So the, the more dot balls or ones I could get, I knew that a bigger shot would come. That's when it plays into the hands of my slow ball. So that's kind of how I used to do it. And then a bouncer, I'd only usually bowl a bouncer to a to a new batter. So if a new batter came in, he was getting a bouncer because he's less likely to hit it. So it was very, I had a very simple plan and that's, I basically stuck by that and didn't really change until international stuff. And that was more about your strengths, wasn't it? Rather yes. than the batter's weaknesses. Yeah. And you never changed that. You always backed your strength. Never changed it because yeah. the other thing is, I guess when I started, I never feared like if I just missed, I would go for six. Bats weren't what they were. Yeah. Players weren't as strong. Ball used to reverse. So your margin favor was a tiny bit bigger. But equally, if you miss hit or you just missed your Yorker, guys were not hitting you for six. They were cloughing it for one down to mid on and mid off. So you weren't being punished for it. Blokes didn't lap both ways. You know, you wouldn't have a kid come in first ball and lap you over short fine leg. It just wasn't a shot. So of course, your confidence build because you just felt like a world beater because nobody was hitting you for any boundaries. I used to pride myself on not going for any boundaries in my death overs. Certainly in one day cricket, it was one of the stats I love. You know, there's a couple of years where I just didn't get hit for boundaries at the end. But we had a ball that was reversing and blokes who weren't as strong and bats that weren't as good. So, of course, they weren't going to be able to. And then the game just seemed to develop so rapidly. And then you jump into the international stage and you're playing in India. And when you miss, you go. The lapping thing's really interesting because that changes Yorkers completely. So yeah. I, what we know now is um, I think it's around 31% of Yorkers um, go where you want them to go. And the rest are full, low full tosses or length balls, right? All the data says that we're just nowhere near as accurate as we should be. I think the most accurate bowler in modern times is Bhuvi Kumar at like 42 or 43%. So it's not like anyone's at 70 or 80. And the, the, when I tracked it um, in one season for Glenn McGrath, so not a lot of data, and I got, he was at about 48, 49%, I think. But that was one season. So I don't know if he was a freak outlier or it would have regressed a little bit. But we know they're not that accurate. But it, your 
a Yorker bowler with a slow ball, do you remember the first time that someone lapped you? Because that must have changed almost everything. Yeah, I'm trying to think who was the first bloke to lap me. I remember being swept. I remember Mel Loy sweeping Mel Loy. me. But that was <laughs> that was something different. Um, I'm trying to think. The first, it might have been, it might have been Joss Butler. Do you know what? When he first burst on for Somerset, we played them in the Pro 40 final, and he was a young cat just coming through. Um, I'm pretty sure he was the first one. And I, th- I remember us talking about it, and I think he did it to me. And I was like, okay, you've done it. Bet you won't do it again, sort of thing. And he, di- he didn't. It was just, so he got it out once, and that, and that was it. Um, but yeah, I'm pretty sure that that's when it first really started coming, coming into my mind. Nobody else really played it. Because until that point, and I know that batters were changing anyway, but that seems like the really big difference because that is such a ball that, you know, suddenly the Yorker can get punished in two directions. Mm-hmm. Before you could put your, your, your guy straight back, you know, you see so often now mid-off or mid, uh, well, usually mid-off is up um, or sometimes up at the death um, because teams will take a punt. No one was taking a punt in those days. Mid-off and mid-on were almost always back unless there was a tailor and uh, batting, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly you've got this new shot, which completely changes everything. And so much so that I would say that it probably eventually meant that every bowler ended up with a slower ball, whereas that was not the case. Uh, But, you know, even, you know, recently I've been noticing that uh, Jason Holder didn't really have a slower ball for years. And, you know, watching bowling against England the other night, he bowled about seven in a row at one stage. Like, and two years ago, I've I've looked at the data, he just wasn't bowling slower balls, right? So Mm -hmm. everyone is getting slower balls. And part of the reason that so many of those guys who never had slow balls before is they couldn't bowl on pace because people would just knock them over their heads, right? So it must have, for you, you I mean, you were right there on the coal face for that. That must have just been a huge sort of change before even the, the guys got really big and started mishitting sixes back over your head. Yeah, it, it was massive. And then messing around with your field, your field all of a sudden had to change. Um, third man... You, you know, third man was a big position where you could always have him back. And now you had to think about maybe bringing him up. And fine leg was just an automatic short 45. You didn't even have to think about it. Mm. All of a sudden, that aspect came into the game. You had to be, you had to actually know who lapped. And then it took my number one delivery potentially out of the game. So the minute somebody got down and lapped you, and, and if I'd executed my York exactly how I wanted to, all of a sudden that put me off bowling, which then meant me reverting to slower balls more often which meant guys setting up for that they kind of then probably knew all they needed to do was get one lap out and it takes one delivery out so he's only got two balls left to bowl here so you know you you can pretty much gamble on sitting back and waiting for a slower ball into the surface or a short one so i i got out thought but there wasn't i didn't feel like there was a lot we could do at that point because everyone just goes oh no york is still a yorker no a york is not still a yorker if some bloke is lapping it like Forget about that statement. It, it, that's, you can't say it's still the best ball in the game when it's not. You know, statistically speaking, nobody delivers it enough for it to be the best ball in the game anymore. And now people have a weapon to get rid of it. So it was tough. That, that, that was hard. And we got the two new balls, which meant the ball wasn't reversing, which, made, which makes bowling Yorkers a hell of a harder. Mm. Uh, just, you know, now that your career is coming to a close... If you were coaching kids now, and you might end up with these sorts of uh, positions. I mean, the way that cricket is going, you might end up being a specialist death bowling coach, you know, in, in the future. How would you train someone coming through now? Now, obviously, you know how quickly the game developed for you during your career. So you know that your experience is only part of it. But how would you, you know, sort of help coach a young death bowler coming through at the moment? I think what we see with death bowling is I think it does kind of full circles very quickly. But fundamentally, exactly what we touched on right at the beginning, know what your know what the, your strengths are. What do you bring to the game? If it's a good slow ball, if it's a good Yorker, or if it's a good bounce, whatever it is, have three balls that you know you can rely on. So at the top of the mark, at the height of pressure, you know you can deliver or rely on something. So my key, every time I talk to young bowlers now or anyone wanting to know about death bowling, I say make sure you've got make sure you've got a Yorker, a Yorker that you're comfortable enough, one that you practice. Have a slower ball because you have to have one with the different surfaces you play on. And don't be afraid to use your bouncer. So those are the three balls I talk about. And then it comes down to practice. You have to practice. Practice, practice, practice your Yorkers. And what I'd say is take, I think, 
now in a weird way, because batters are so capable of hitting 360, I actually think field positions become irrelevant almost to a certain degree. Now, people are going to be shouting by listening to me say that. But I mean that in the sense of the unpredictability, because batters can turn around, you could set a field, a batter will know what balls you can bowl. If I set everyone back on the leg side, he knows what I'm going to bowl. I'm going to be tight on him into leg stump, you know, either into the surface or full. That's it. That's all I can do. So you kind of, you give away the ghost by setting your field in particular ways. I think set a field where you can bowl two, two or three deliveries. Okay. Once that's sorted, all you need to concentrate is those two or three deliveries and then mixing them up in an order, which allows you to stay on top of the batter. So I think completely simplified, drag it back to its bare bones, be very good at two or three balls, set a field that you're comfortable with that allows you to bowl more than one delivery and execute. That's it. I think we've, you, you can try and look too far. You can try and overanalyze or understand what this batter's trying to do or when he does this or what he does. Fundamentally, it's a, it's a competition between you and a batter who's going to come out on top. There's going to be a winner. There's going to be a loser. Understand that. Deliver your skill to the best of your ability. If you want to bowl slow, if you want to bowl slow ball bounce because you think that's the best option and he hits you for six, so be it. You delivered your skill. The plan might have been wrong, but you can address the plan afterwards. Hmm. It's, it's the commitment to the skill, practicing it, and then delivering it. It's also probably putting your hand up and saying you're willing to do it. And willing again. to do it, again. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's probably the big elephant in the room, yeah. And then, you know, just finally on your career, um, you know, you, you had a really long professional career. You played for England. Um, you know, you, you played league cricket, uh, you know, franchise cricket around the world. How do you feel coming? I mean, I, I don't want to officially retire you, but how do you feel sort of coming to the end? Are you now at peace in a way? It didn't, it, it felt to me, especially in that, in that period that you just weren't a cricketer at peace, right? Mm -hmm. You know, probably the, the height of your England career, as you, you, you discussed earlier. Are, are you now more at peace with what you did? Because you must have teammates who, well, I, I said, that, you know, um, Gareth Batty talked about you, uh, uh, you know, in that period of being unplayable um, at the death. And, you know, we've certainly seen periods where you've done that and you've taken down the best players in the world, right? With, with, your, with your Yorkers and your Stoller balls. But everything else was on top of you. Are you now a bit more at peace with where you, where you fit into cricket? 100%. 100%. You know, I, I look back very fondly on what I achieved all the opportunities I had because as a young boy of 15, 16, just starting out playing the game because I loved it, had you offered me 55 games for England, a 16-year career with the biggest club in the country, in my opinion, went to win trophies, to play with my best mates who will remain mates for the rest of my life, to meet all the people I have, travel the world, all these things. Of course, I look back at, on it so fondly. I'm so happy and pleased with everything I achieved. Would I like to have done more? Absolutely. Everybody would have done, you know, you'd be, you're not a fulfilled human if you don't think that, you know, that's why we wake up every day to better ourselves. So of course I would have wanted to achieve more, but I'm sat here, a very happy man with, with what I did. I knew I, I played with my heart on my sleeve every single time I gave hundred percent, never shied away from a challenge. Um, and those are all the kind of things I wanted to, to show. And, you know, to my little boy now, hopefully he, he gets into cricket and he plays, those are all the things you can ask for. So I'm sat here very happy. Hopefully I can pass on, continue to pass on some of the knowledge I've gained and more the kind of experiences, I guess, which is the big thing with helping, with helping guys. I feel, you know, the kind of mental aspect of dealing with death bowling and fast bowling and, you know, franchise cricket traveling around. It's, these are things I'd hopefully like to add to, to some cricket teams in the future. And so when your son comes through, I'm assuming the first thing you're going to teach him is the cross ball, the cross seam ball, so he can bowl in the middle over so he doesn't have to bowl in the death. He's going to be a left arm Chinaman who slogged him. <laughs> Perfect. Thanks for coming on, mate. Mate, thanks for having me.